Acts chapter 6. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, the disciples, not apostles, disciple is one who disciplines himself. He's left all, Jesus told us. He's left his family. His family don't want to serve. This is great for Jewish theology here. They want to serve Jesus. They don't care what the family says. You want to have a mock funeral? Go ahead. I'm going to carry my cross. Now the, the carrying the cross is understand the death, torment, torture. The disciples multiplied. And there rose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. Oh, look at that. Still Jews. The Gentiles has a controversy with the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So as we come into chapter 6, we're running about, people are getting saved, they're hearing the gospel, uh, signs and wonders and healings, and widows are not getting any help. And that's the law. But even outside the law, even Paul will direct Timothy in care of widows. Widows... Under the decree that Paul tells Timothy that there's rules and regulations, they're not supposed to be under Social Security. They're supposed to be under the help of the church. They're supposed to be ministering to the church. They're supposed to be helping the church to grow. Anna prayed. Anna was some, hey, you know, when I go to the temple, that woman over there would pray. They would be the ones that would go and clean the church. And they're not being taken care of by the church. Then the twelve called the multitude. This is the twelve apostles. Called the multitude of the disciples unto them. All right, gathered together. This would be the, the second meeting of the disciples among the people. First one was at Pentecost. They gathered together. Now they're going to have a church meeting. And said, it is not reason that we, the apostles, should leave the word of God and serve tables. It is the job of the apostle, it is the job of the pastor, the one that is head of the church. His job is the word of God. He's not to serve tables. Serve tables, you know, take care of the little things. That's not his job. His job is to study. He's, he's not to have a secular job. You say, well, Paul had a job. Paul was not a pastor. He was an evangelist. And Timothy, uh, under Timothy, Paul writes, hey, you know what? That pastor's to receive double of what you guys are getting for a salary. The little things is not supposed to be taken care of by the pastor. It's supposed to be taken care of by, and what you would call here deacons. And they're not called deacons in chapter 6. You don't see the word deacon. There is a need in the church, and we've got to find some men who will meet those needs, and it's not the apostles. The apostles have a work to do. they got to go out and start churches. they got to go out and preach the word. We don't have time for these little things. Wherefore, brethren, so save individuals of like faith. Look ye out among you seven men of honest report. Number one. This is a short chapter. Number one, if you want to call it a deacon or somebody who's going to help the pastor, he is to have an honest report. That is found when Paul writes Timothy and Titus about the preacher. You have to be honest in this dishonest world. And we just read in a previous chapter about two people who who lied against God and lied against the Holy Spirit, and God took them out. Honesty seems to be the number one thing in the ministry. And yet, turn on the radio and television, you will not see no honesty. The fraud and the lies of Satan that's been involved in the churches when you go out with the gospel, with the truth, has ailed the witness of people trying to witness the gospel because of all the failure and lies of the ministries. Somebody out there knows a pastor ran off with somebody. Somebody know, out there knows a, 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 a financial person of the church who ran off with the money. Many people know of a church who's built this big thing and could not finish it. 
honest report, number one, of all the qualifications we run into these men. What's the, first, we, the widows need to be taken care of. What's the first thing you look for? Honesty. Maybe they learned that from Judas. He was anything but honest. Full of the Holy Ghost. Honesty became before the Holy Ghost. Isn't that interesting? When you're marking the third member of the Trinity, and when it comes to the service of the ministry, honesty becomes before the Holy Ghost. God cannot and ever will lie. Never. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the Holy Spirit is referenced in the Gospel of John, the Spirit of truth. And it not only says of the Holy Ghost, but says full of the Holy Ghost, not half full. Not a quarter of a tank full. Full. That's somebody who's in the Word. That's someone who's praying. That's someone who's active with God daily. Want to look around churches? And wisdom. Oh. Godly wisdom. I don't care if you've got wisdom with money or friends, right? Wisdom of God, because we got honesty, we get the Holy Spirit, and we got wisdom. Now look at those three attributes. Honest, full of the Holy Ghost, and wisdom. It's not what you are, who you are, who you know. It's your character. Whom we may appoint over this business of what? Taking care of the widows. That's just the widows. I mean, a bunch of men will take care of the women whose husbands have died. You're going to look for somebody that's honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, and wisdom. Gee, I wonder what kind of men you're going to look for when it comes to the ministry itself. And Paul gives us a complete list twice. We don't need a Judas taking care of these women. They may not get all that they deserve. And these women are going to serve the ministry. They should get all that's due to them. If they're following Christ and their husbands are dead, they're definitely not going to get no money from Israel. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to ministry of the word. That is the pastor, 1 Timothy 5.17. That guy is, ought to be in prayer all the time and in the Word. That's the ministry. That is the occupation of a pastor. With men that are under him, that are honest, full of the Holy Ghost, and wisdom. And you want to see what, what that pastor's qualifications are, you go to 1 Timothy and then you go to Titus. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, all the people. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith. Ooh, there's another. You got to have faith. And of the Holy Ghost. Came together, full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost together Stephen had. Now, that's not to say that Stephen doesn't, doesn't flounder or, you know, gets a little doubts here and there. I mean, it happens. We're all human. We look at certain things and say, wow. But Stephen was known for his faith and the Holy Ghost. Well, who is Stephen? Where did this guy show up, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and six chapters in the book of Acts? Where has he shown up? And here he is, a remarkable man, called for a part of the ministry to help the church, and here he is. He's been silent through all the Gospels now. But when they're looking for one person with qualifications, sir, Stephen. And we'll even add some to his qualifications just to prove to you. Philip. Philip is going to raise his daughters to be prophecies of revelations. We'll run into Philip later and his daughters will, are going to go out and witness and tell people about their, they will go to hell. They will tell them about what will happen if they don't believe on God. They will tell them what will happen what's to come. Philip would bring his children up in the Lord. That's exactly what God told said about Abraham. I know he'll raise those children from me. 
He's got other problems, but I know when it comes to his children. Procurious. Well, you don't see him no more. That doesn't say anything. He's a failure. And Knight Kanor. And Timon. And Farnesas. And Nicholas. You didn't think St. Nicholas was in the Bible, did you? But this ain't the guy with a white beard running around in a sleigh. This is the Bible, St. Nicholas. And what is his duty? He is honest report. Hmm. Full of the Holy Ghost. Stealing your cookies and your milk. Breaking in entries in the house. That's not something full of the Holy Ghost. Kissing mommy. A married woman. That's not somebody full of the Holy Ghost. Running grandma over. That's definitely not. You say you're taking it too far. Hey, that's the songs you sing about that guy. And wisdom. The guy travels around at night. So no one can see him. And he's prejudiced. Because he won't give bad boys and girls any gifts. There is a Nicholas in the Bible. And it's not Santa Claus. A proselyte. Of Antioch. Now Antioch, 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 I can't say it. That's interesting because that's where Christians are first called Christians, and that is the root right there for your 1611 Bible. Right there. And you got a Nicholas who's a proselyte of Antioch, and you got an Antichrist Nicholas running around giving you anything but the Bible. If we're going to choose anybody in the Bible, have the world go after, let's choose a Nicholas. But let's have him live not after the Bible, Nicholas. Antioch in your Bible is positive, it's good, it's strong. It's where your Bible comes from. Whom they set before the apostles, right? Stephen, Philip. Parcudius, Nicuri, Timon, Farmenius, Nicholas, come in, stand before the twelve. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Oh, look at that. They're, they are ordaining these men. Now, come on. You think Peter's is going to just lay his hands on anybody? You think John is going to say, oh, okay, fine. You know of at least four of those uh, disciples, apostles, you know that they're, they're going to make sure. This is just ain't no find an ad in back of a magazine and, you know, send away money and get your ordained papers. Which I've been told by several people, since I've not ever been ordained, why don't you go do that? No, if God wants to be ordained, he'll ordain me. He'll set the time and place. If I need it to be done, I'll let God take care of it. I've got my degree. I've got my study record. And right now, God seems to be pleased with that. The word of God increased. What? How did the word in God increase? Are we now reading six chapters of Acts that we had no chapters in Acts? And the word of God increased. How did it increase? There are people who are getting saved. They are believing on Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior the Messiah, and they're going out and telling people. That's how the word of God increased. It gets spread out. Which is telling you that they're going out with the word of God, telling people about God by the word of God. It's spreading out. It's going where it has not gone. And the number of the disciples multiply in Jerusalem greatly. So see, the word's going out. People are dedicating themselves to live right for God. That's what that disciple means. And don't tell me Peter, John, James, and all of them did not sit down and say, listen, this is what Jesus said about the discipleship. You better be forewarned. Before you, you build that army, before you build that, that building, you got to make sure you're based on the foundation, the, the, the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. And you better, you know, even before... All right, all that live godly shall suffer. You better realize what Jesus went through. You better realize what we just heard about Peter and John, what they went through. They were beaten for the word of God. You better realize it's not an easy life to become a disciple of Jesus. And they haven't heard about rewards yet. Paul brings that. And they're standing up to play without a complete Bible, without learning about anything rewards. They say, we will suffer for Jesus. 
And we know about the judgment seat of Christ. We know about the five crowns. We know about eternal, what Paul has written to us, and we can't stand up for Christ. We cannot be disciples for Jesus Christ. So when you got to tell your family, you got to tell everybody, listen, I'm going to serve Jesus. That's it. That's a disciple. And these people are standing. And when they're in Israel, they can't get a job. Because the priests are against them. We've seen that in chapter 5. The Roman government is not pleased with Jesus. The word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Jewish still. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Well, look at that. There is more preaching going on in the temple. And you say, well, what did John and Peter do by preaching at the temple? Here are some priests that put down the, the bloody sacrifice of a cow, a goat, or whatever was offered. And said, I'm going to turn to the blood of God. Now, that did not please God. What what? Please God in the book of Acts. When he sees his Levite saying, we're turning to you, Messiah. And now we'll go not minister the blood of the bulls, the goats, and all that. But we'll minister your blood, Jesus Christ. Now, how's that? And you know what? What, Paul, what John will tell us later in, in Revelation chapter 1, we're all priests. I just ain't a father. But I'm a priest. I lift up prayers for people, saved or lost. That was part of the priest's job. That's what John the Baptist, I can never remember his father, but that's what John the Baptist's father was doing. He goes in the temple in the time of prayer. Zacharias. Zacharias. Never remember his name. That's exactly what I do. I take that prayer, the incense that God's given me, I burn it before God. This person needs prayer. I need prayer, Lord. Now, here are Levitical Jewish priests that have believed on God. Yes, there were priests that believed on God. Now, don't tell me that didn't make the chief priests angry and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're looking at the temple right now. Where's... How come this wasn't... Well, he went and followed the Jesus crew. And Stephen, full of faith and power. Now, faith and power. I'm going to listen. People can say they got faith, they got faith, they got faith. What power do you have? You can say it, but there's no power that goes with it, and you ain't got it. Stephen is recognized. Faith, and it did something in his life. Did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now look, now he's working signs and wonders. To the honor and glory of God alone and not Stephen. Then there arose certain of the, of the synagogue. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here's the church of Jerusalem. The synagogues. Which synagogue came out from Babylon. The synagogue came from the Jews being in Babylon. And you know what kind of gods Babylon had. Which is called the synagogue of the Libertines. Ooh. Oh, you got those running around in America today. Libertarians. And Cyrenians. And Alexarians. And that's bad. That's Africa. That's where your perverted Bibles come from. So you got in this chapter, you got Stephen that is recognized for Antioch, a man of Antioch. And you got Alexander, uh, people mentioned that are going against Stephen. Notice the, the reference there. You got men of God referencing Antioch, and you got people going against the men of God referencing Alexandria. Alexandria in the Bible or Alex, anything like that is, it's poor. And of them of Sicilia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. 
So Stephen stands up for the ministry, starts doing what he's supposed to be doing, and instant persecution, instant fighting. Stephen makes an enemy for the word of God. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spent. They couldn't overpower him. They couldn't, they couldn't shut him up. They couldn't put him down. They couldn't make him stop. I've been there. I've got distracted. And it's hard to pick up when, when you've been distracted. It's hard. It's only the Holy Spirit saying, just keep on going. But Lord, I, I, no, just don't worry about that. Lord, I, I, don't worry about that. That guy, keep, that, don't, just keep open your mouth for me. Whatever you do, don't shut up. They won. Once that mouth is shut, they won. Now, when your 45 minutes is up, okay, then you shut your mouth. You did everything proper and the way you're supposed to be. But they couldn't shut Stephen. They couldn't stop him. They couldn't do anything against him. That's his power. Then they suborned men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemy words against Moses and against God. Well, we got to lie about him now. Now do you see why you're going to have an honest report? Because they're going to lie about the men of God. And you got to have such a good report that someone said, hey, listen. I've seen that Christian over there. He said this, and the world would say, I don't think so. And I've had this happen to me in my life. I had somebody call me, call my job one time, say, Stiley cussed me out. He gave me a rotten hard time, blah, 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 blah. And I tell you, when that manager of the place I worked for talked to that person on the phone, they laughed at that person on the phone. And told him, said, listen, if you would have said any one of my drivers, I would I would listen to you. But you you said, Stolly, I don't believe it. And that became a joke. Because I was a man of an honest report. I lived the Christian life, and I'm not boasting. I'm saying somebody tried to put me down and tried to lie about me. I had an honest report among the men. So when these liars came up, they was even the unsaved people would say, Stephen? No, absolutely wrong. Not Stephen. Now, the only thing that was Stephen would say against Moses, I don't think anything against God would be the law is done. We're getting rid of the law. We're going to a new dispensation. It's no more bull of goats and an ox and all that. It's the blood of Jesus. That's the only thing he would say against Moses. But even that, because he would say Moses spoke about the Messiah. So the case of Moses would be they were half listening and twisted his word. But against God, absolutely not. Not with the power of the Holy Spirit. And they stirred up the people. Well, that's what they did at Jesus' trial before Pilate. Causing a riot, causing a ruckus is a thing that unsaved people will do. It may even get you boogie-woogieing to music. And the elders and the scribes, these are the ones in charge of the word, are going against the word. We have them today. They're called modern Bibles. And came upon him and caught him. We're still talking about Stephen. This one guy has caused a ruckus and brought him to the council. The same one that John and Peter and the other apostles showed up. So now we're going into six chapters of the book of Acts and arresting Christians has become the norm. So when you got a church out there who the, who the world loves, oh, that's just a great people-friendly church. That's just a great church. They're just a bunch of wonderful people over there. They ain't doing nothing for God. When a, when a Christian is mentioned among the world and, and, and family and, and the workplace, uh, ugh, sh just shut up. I don't want to hear that name. Stephen's causing a ruckus. I like to be a, a Stephen. I like to be a ruckus for the Lord. And I'm, he's not doing it purposely. He's just living for God and they hate him. They brought him to the, to the council and set up false witnesses. 
Again, Stephen, why do you got to be an honest report? Because they're going to call all kinds of liars just like they did with Jesus. And you know what happened when they bought the false witnesses to, about Jesus before the chief priests, the liars, the wicked men? They couldn't even agree amongst themselves. They're sitting there fighting. Well, he said this. Well, that's not what he said. He said that. No, no, guys. I heard him say it. And they can't get anybody. So the own liars' testimonies couldn't lie about Jesus because they lied amongst themselves. Don't worry about liars. Listen, if people say things about you and they're not true, and God and you and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit know you are true and that you did not do, then just rest assured in God, you're doing things right. And which said, this man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. I can believe that. You say, what are you talking about? Stephen's probably saying that this temple has nothing to do anymore. The temple is seated at the right hand of the Father right now. If Stephen's going to say anything about that temple. He might even be preaching Matthew 25 saying this temple is going to be destroyed. He could be doing that. That's one of the charges they brought against Jesus. He destroyed the temple in three days, built it back. That wasn't what he was talking about. And Jesus said in 70 AD, which would be 67 years from now, that temple is going to be destroyed again, and it, will, it has not been built yet. The Dumb of the Rock is sitting there right now, which the United Nations now says that that Jerusalem, that spot does not belong to the Jews. It will never be the Jews and has not been the Jews. It belongs to Ishmael. That's what the United Nations said three weeks ago. We'll see what God has to say about it. So against the holy place. Well, their holy place was the entire temple, including where, where the animals will go poop for buying, for buying them to bring them to the altar. But there was one holy place. And there was one most holy place. And we forgot that the curtain between the two was ripped. And I have access into the most holy place. That temple is not my holy place. My church is not my holy place. I have access, Paul says. I can walk up to the throne of God and say, Father, I got a petition. That's my holy place. My holy place is when I look to the right of the Father, I see Jesus Christ with his nail-pierced hand, with his nail-pierced feet, with the hole in this side, Lord Jesus, you're my holy place. It's all rest upon you, Jesus. I need help. You know what happened, Zacharias? If somebody walked in there, anytime he went in there to burn the incense of prayer, they would be zapped. Uzziah got hit with leprosy, and he went in there, in there to burn incense because I think because he loved the Lord, but that's not his place. Aaron's two boys went in there, burnt the wrong fire. <laughs> They're gone. And I step over that mess, that temple, and step into the Holy of Holies, into the heavenly heavenly, and say, Father, I've got a prayer because I just want to thank you for what you've done for me. I want to thank you that curtain behind me is ripped because of Jesus Christ. Thank you very much, Lord. You know, if you were to bring this to Jerusalem today, the holy place, go on Mount Moriah and say, the holy Where is it? Where's your holy place? It ain't there. It ain't there. You got the wailing wall. Well, I've got, I've got the God that takes all will and wipes them away and gives me peace, love, love, and suffering through the Holy Ghost. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth, there's that Jewish, shall destroy this place. Maybe he is preaching Matthew 25. If he is, then he's prophesying what's going to happen. He is saying, this is true. He is saying exactly what Jesus told his disciples. This, you see how wonderful this place is? It's going to be trotted down. He wept over this. To them, it's a lie. I wonder what they said 71 AD. 
Most of these people probably would not have been alive. They probably were killed in the siege. What we're reading right now, this is true. What if Stephen was preaching what Jesus told them about that temple. 70 AD, 67 years with Stephen would be an absolute truth. Shall change the customs which Moses delivered unto us. Was Stephen a liar? I can go into a restaurant and order lobster and bow my head and say, Lord God, I thank you for this delicious lobster and crabs and scallops. Oh, Lord God, thank you for the pork ribs. And God said, you're welcome. I like that. You really are sincere about it. Now, right now, if you were to walk into a seafood restaurant and, and say, Lord, I, I like that lobster. We're in the dispensation right now. God would be like, you better get that out of your mouth. Especially if it was definitely the Old Testament. If Moses walked up and said, oh, Lord, I thank you for this baby back part. You better put that down, Moses. You put that to your mouth and I'm, you're dead. So the customs have been brought. Excuse me. When was the last time I went and got a lamb to bring to Israel on the three times a year that as a male? I, they're supposed to go. To, I haven't. Never have. Eight, I, had a, I had a baby boy. Eight days, I could not have him circumcised. I think it was three days. Things have changed. If you didn't circumcise your son under the Old Testament law, eight days, that's it. He's gone. If you're, if you're a Jew that was an Abrahamic covenant, if your child was not circumcised on the eighth day, God told Abraham, they're cut off. Hospitals today outdo the law because we got to get you and the baby out of that hospital right away so we can have the next mother come in with the baby and get them out right away. So things have changed. We're not under the law. This is prophecy. Stephen's saying, listen, the law is going. Well, of course it's going to anger the priest. How are they going to make a living? We've already seen Jesus walk into their church building and he knocks the cassette tapes over. He kicks the records over. He gets rid of the posters and all that. Man, he got rid. That's got to go. That's going bye bye pretty soon. You're not going to have that man. You don't need a lamb. You don't need a cow. You don't need to bring your grain. You need Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ fulfilled the entire law, which I could not do. You realize I rest in damnation if I was under the law every single day. The first commandment, I am never mind the nine, the first one. The first commandment is God first all the time. Listen, I don't open my eyes to think about God. At the age I am, the way my body is, the first thing I think about when I open up my eyes is I got to go pee. That's not thinking about God. And yet the law said I'm to think about God first all the time. I'm to love him with all my heart, mind, soul, and everything. I don't do that. We have heard this man, that this Jesus Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the, the customs which Moses delivered with us. Kind of funny for them to say this Jesus of Nazareth because to them he's dead and gone. How is he going to come and destroy everything? They don't believe in the resurrected Christ, but they say Jesus is going to come and destroy it all. Uh-huh. You see what they're preaching? Jesus rose from the grave. And when they stand in the courtroom, that Jesus who was resurrected is coming to... Uh-huh. It's a resurrection. Stephen is preaching the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And all that sat in the council. Looking steadfastly on him, Stephen saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. And oh boy, wait till we get to chapter 7. And we're going to close there. Stephen right now has got the, the eyes of the entire council focused on him. He's like a little lamb with a bunch of wolves and their teeth are salivating. They're foaming at the mouth. Man, they've got, I don't know what you put lamb with, but they got the sauce and the juices to put that lamb. Because they're going to kill him. But before they kill him, 
Stephen does a remarkable thing. Lord willing, we're going to learn that he's going to teach those men everything about Israel before he's cooked.